You're listening to the Mike Eckford Show on CKNW News Talk 980. You can email me, Mike, at CKNW.com. On Twitter, it's at Michael Eckford and at CKNW. Bouton Law is CKNW's new on-air legal analyst for 2015. And sometimes they join us to give us the lowdown on legal solutions, whether you're in business or, or maybe just in your life in general. But very often we need them to explain the legal implications behind some of the biggest stories that we cover. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Because considering the number of stories that we've covered in the last weeks and months that have involved violent repeat offenders being released back into communities with at times horrific outcomes for innocent people, we thought that we should learn more and want you to learn more about the dangerous offender designation. When is it used? Why isn't it used more? Those are some of the questions that we know people want answered and some insights into. Wally Opal joining us. He is a lawyer, former judge as well, uh, and a lawyer right now with Boughton Law. Hi, Wally. How are you? Hey, good to see you. With, good to be with you again. Well, nice to uh, have you join us because I, I think there's a lot of confusion about the dangerous offender designation. Can you just give us an outline first, uh, Mr. Opal, about sure. what that is? Sure, Mike. Uh, it's a term that's, that's, I think it's been misused out there. Uh, But there's a very strict legal definition as to what and who should be a a dangerous offender. If a person has committed a violent crime uh, or a series of violent crimes, there's been a repetitive behavior of uh, violence in a person's uh, life, and there's little likelihood that that person is going to rehabilitate himself then in those circumstances, if that person constitutes a continuous danger to the public, then a judge may declare that person to be a dangerous offender. But what happens so often in the items that you cover uh, in the news, uh, Mike, is that we look at it after the fact. Right. Yeah. See, the application has to be made at the time of sentencing. So very often that the people who make the news should have been declared na- dangerous offenders maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And so there who, may not have been enough evidence at that time to, to have them declared that. But Who, who instigates that process, that process pro- to have them designated or, or the possibility to have them good, designated? A good question. The prosecution does that. After a person has been convicted of a violent crime uh, or a crime involving uh, uh, any... any to the personal integrity of a person. Yeah. It could be anything from sexual offenses to assaults to uh, to uh, murders or anything of that sort. The Crown can make an application before a judge, and the judge will then order an assessment done of that person. Uh, now, there are two classes of, of uh, these types of offenses. It's a long-term offender and a dangerous offender. The dangerous offender is a more serious of the two. That remedy is reserved for the worst of the worst. And uh, and the reason is because once a person is declared a dangerous offender, the sentence that person received is called an indeterminate sentence, an indefinite sentence. In other words, there's no number on that right. sentence. It's uh, It goes on forever unless there's a review every three years. Yeah. And... Uh, and you're under the supervision of the court forever and ever. And so courts need to have strong evidence before they will uh, warehouse a person, and that's really what happens. The Americans have done that, and uh, they have people in jail who are now 70, 75 years old, and they're not a danger to anybody. So there's a real danger that it can be misused. So is that why it isn't used more, because of that concern that it, no. that it will be misused? No, I, th- I think it's been used fairly appropriately. Uh, I was a former Crown prosecutor, and we used it, and we've, it's been used before me when I was on the Supreme Court. Um, but a lot of the times where we discuss in the public arena as to why someone wasn't declared a dangerous offender. We're talking for the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, right. it, it may have been that at that particular time when the person was convicted and was sentenced, there wasn't enough evidence. Because the Crown prosecutors are pretty conscientious and they work right. with the police and they bring on these applications. And, you know, there's no shortage of these applications. And uh, so that may be the case. Uh, 
you know, I can't say for sure why yeah. it well, isn't used more often. Well, but. maybe what you can talk about is the, the latitude that a judge has as well within that designation. You mentioned two things. Was one of them long-term offender? Long-term offender. Long-term offender, it, that designation is used. Uh, it's a lesser of the two. And so that's used uh, where the court will sentence someone to two or more years and then have that person in, this, in supervision for 10 years. So the maximum is 10 years under a long-term offender designation. The more serious one is the dangerous offender because the under dangerous offenders, there are so many people who are in there forever, right. and they will never see the light of day. The, you know, the serial killers, the, yeah. uh, the uh, serial uh, rapists, the uh, chronic sex offenders, the pedophiles, and, and many of them will never, ever get out. Uh, there's been a challenge, too, has there not, in, in uh, B.C. Supreme Court? And, and where does that stand right now? There was a court challenge to the dangerous offenders law based on charter rights. And what were the issues there? And, and do you have any idea where that well, process well, is? Well, I, I don't know exactly where it is in the courts, but there's always that concern that the, that the uh, uh, designation will be used in an arbitrary way and will not right. take into account that a person may be capable of rehabilitation. In fact, I think the courts are very, very careful, uh, because what you're really doing, Mike, is you're, you're locking up a person, and in effect, you're throwing away the key. Right. And uh, so a judge has to be very careful that there may be that remote possibility that someone may be cured, and someone may be rehabilitated with proper treatment. The reality is that the jails are not really a place too many people get rehabilitated. Right. Uh, they're violent places. And uh, more often than not, once a person goes in there for 15 or 20 years, uh, they're going to come out worse. And that's the reality of life. And, you know, we need to know that. So one of the byproducts of sending people to a federal penitentiary for long, long periods of time is that at the end of the day, if that person is released, then that person could be worse. Right. Excellent insights. Uh, Mr. Opal, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your views on this and the information you passed along. Good to be with you, Mike. All right. Wally Opal from Boughton Law, once again, our on-air legal analyst for 2015. And that's why we have him. Is, is, you know, I got a lot of emails from people saying, how does the dangerous offender designation actually work? How is it applied? Uh, are we doing this properly? Can we look at another way? So hopefully that gave you some answers. Send me an email, Mike, at cknw.com.